Hi, welcome back to Sound and Voltage. I'm Jeff. I took a bit of an extended break from the channel to recharge, and while I wasn't making videos, I was still pretty active on online forums, and one thing that seemed clear is that there's a real need for introductory level content around modular and synthesis in general. So with this first post-break video, I'm going to scale it all the way back to the simplest module you can really have. If we were just working with cables, we'd probably just call it a splitter, but in modular, it's the good old multiple or mult. And it would be hard to get much more simple than this. You give it an input signal, and it outputs multiple copies of that same signal. Clocks, triggers, general CV, audio, doesn't really matter. Voltage goes in, multiple copies come out. And since they are so simple, they're also dead easy to build, and a great first project if you're interested in getting into DIYing your own gear. That's how I got started. So in just a little bit, I'm going to build a couple of them. So you can see the process, and then at the end of the video, there's going to be a giveaway of a couple of kits so you can build your own. Stick around for that. So what do you do with them? Making a copy of the signal sounds great, but why? So let's look at a couple of common uses, and maybe one that's a little less common. For me, the most common uses is part of clock signal distribution. I've got a clock tick that I'm working with, and I want multiple modules to be aware of it. Sometimes it's for playing individual notes or advancing multiple sequencers. A lot of modules, delays especially, allow you to sync the delay to an incoming clock, so I'll run something to it. Now, if you've got Pamela's Workout or my trusty 4MS quad clock distributor, you could just set multiple channels to have the same tempo or clock division, but that's pretty wasteful. Instead, I pretty much always take my master clock and run it to a mult sitting right next to it, and now I've got several copies of that clock that it can drive my patch. Many mults will let you choose between one input and six outputs, or two inputs with three outputs each. We're going to see more about that in a little bit. But with clocks, I'll often have one of them keep my standard tempo, and another one to have a divided by two or multiplied by two clock division. Another common use for them is I'll take an LFO or some other modulation source and copy it, and then I'll use that modulation in multiple places in the patch to create a more cohesive character to the sound. As sections mix in and out, they'll retain that underlying rhythm from the modulation. It's a neat effect. And speaking of mixing, that's another common use for me. I'll take an audio output and feed it into the mult to make several copies, and then I'll run each copy through a different effect or filter. Then those can be mixed together at different levels, and that can be really fun, especially with a matrix mixer. You might have noticed that the one type of signal I haven't mentioned is pitch. There are actually two flavors of multiple. There are passive mults, and that's what we've been talking about here and what I'm going to build in a little bit. They aren't powered, and it's possible that the voltage being input can drop as you add connections. It doesn't take that big a drop for the change in pitch to be noticeably out of tune. Although, I actually tried to pull together a demo showing this voltage drop happening, and I couldn't get it to work. Maybe it's not that big of a deal anymore the way these are built, but you should be aware that that's something that could happen. And if it does happen, that's where you use a buffered mult. Buffer just means that each of the outputs has its own operational amplifier, or op amp, and that makes sure that all of the outputs are exactly what was sent in. I keep one of those around as well, but I don't use it nearly as much as I do the passive mults. And I do have rather a lot of them. I have at least five, and I think I'm missing one here. You might have noticed that most of these are from AI Synthesis. They're not a sponsor or anything, I just think they have some really great introductory level kits. These ones are actually the very first modules I ever built, these specific ones, and I still use them in practically every patch. So that's what I'm going to build here in a moment. It's the first step in a whole analog-only rack that I'm going to build to do further demonstrations like this, especially with the cool uh, new fancy black panels. If there's anything you really want to know more about, leave a comment and let me know. So I think it makes sense at this point to actually look at the schematic for a mult. Especially if you're going to give DIYing a try, there's a good chance that you're going to eventually end up coming back to the schematic to try to figure out what's going on. And reading a schematic is a learned skill, and honestly, I'm not that fantastic at it, but in this case, I've put them side by side with an image of the malt, and that'll hopefully make things clearer, more clear at least. And you know, all of those connections that are marked P$3, those are just the ground pins, and they're all wired together, so let's get rid of those to make things a bit simpler. Okay, that's better. You can see how there are two groups of four jacks, and the first in each group is labeled as an in. That's actually a bit misleading. You can see here that it's all really just wired together. There isn't anything special about that first jack. We call the first one the input pretty much just by convention, but you can use any of the jacks as the input and the rest are outputs. And more than that, you can actually run multiple inputs into it and have the voltages get mingled and mixed. Here's an example where I have two LFOs coming in, and then in red you can see how the result is the mixture of the two. 
Now this isn't exactly recommended use. You can end up with higher than normal voltages and you will have inputs receiving part of that output signal. That isn't usually a problem, but be aware that you are abusing the module a little bit to do something it wasn't intended for. But that can be fun sometimes. Since this video is so focused, I think maybe let's go one step further with this and get right down to what's going on inside the jack. That's all this module is after all, just a bunch of jacks soldered to a board, so we might as well look deeper. And here's a diagram of the jack. You can see there are three pins. Number one is just the ground, and those are all going to get wired together. Number three is the signal that's going to come in from or out to the cable you're going to plug into the jack. And number two is what the output or input would be if you don't plug anything in. What's important is what happens when you plug in the jack. When the jack is empty, number two and number three are connected, physically connected. And if you've heard about an input being normal, that's what this means. Whatever is connected to number two acts as a default until you plug something into it. At that point, the tip of the plug pushes the connector away, breaking that connection between number two and number three, and now the connection to the plug is used instead. And that's how we get the difference between using the MULT in a configuration where it has one input and six outputs, or two inputs with three outputs each. In the first case, that second input is just normal to whatever the first input is. In the second case, that normalization is broken, and now you have two separate sections to the MULT, each with three individual outputs. Okay, wow, that was genuinely more than I intended to say on the subject of how jacks work, but I hope you found it interesting. Moving on. So let's get to some soldering, but a couple of things before I get started. The first is that I've built a fairly large number of modules now, and I've upgraded my equipment. You don't need a fancy soldering station or a vise to put things in. Sure, it makes things easier, but I didn't have them when I started. In the comments, I'm going to include links to a basic soldering iron that'll do the job, plus a bit of solder. If your eyes are old and tired like mine, you might want a magnifier with a light. That's made a big difference for me. Also, I have a pretty deep stock of parts here, so when I bought the mults, I just went with the PCB in panels. But many DIY retailers will sell full kits where they've gone to the trouble of finding all the parts for you and packaging them up. Learning how to source your own parts is one of the more frustrating aspects of DIYing modules. So until you know you want to keep doing this, just go with the full kits. Alright, let's get going. This module really is very simple. I mean, there's the PCB in the panel that came from AI Synthesis. There are the jacks that are going to be mounted on it, and then there are the hex nuts that are going to hold the jacks onto the panel, and that's really about it. So that's all we need to get started with this. So we're just going to start by putting the jacks onto the PCB. Now, of course, I was holding <laughs> a little outside of camera range, so you're going to have to put up with that. But you can see that each of the jacks just has three pins, and the PCB makes it pretty clear how those pins are going to be put in. They go in really easily. It's a little finicky in places, especially when you get to the end and you risk uh, knocking one of the other ones out, but it's pretty easy to do. Now with this module, it's actually pretty easy, but this is one of the trickier parts when you're starting to assemble more complex modules, and that's getting the front panel seated on top of all of the jacks and knobs and LEDs that you might be working with. However, with something like this, it's dead easy, and it really just slides right on top. Now you wanna use a couple of these nuts just to hold everything together during the soldering process, but you don't have to put them all on. And they don't have to be tightened up or anything. This is just to hold everything together. Just finger tight is fine.
you can see all the pins along the back there, and that's all that there really is to this. There's eight jacks and three pins each, so we've got 24 solder points we have to put down. And I like to use, I've got a couple of different vices. It just helps keep everything firm together and uh, gets a little bit closer to my eyes. And in this case, I can just have the jack hold on to the front panel. And that keeps the PCB out of the way so I can do the soldering. Now with these jacks, the pins are actually really small. And since the pins are really small, the uh, holes that they go into are pretty small. These are gonna be really tiny little solder points. Often they're gonna be bigger than this, but uh, uh, it doesn't make them any more difficult to do. You have to be a little careful that you don't have a solder bridge between them, but you'll see here in a second, it's not a problem. So I've got the soldering iron there to the right. I've got it set to uh, 720 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe. I've got uh, the solder there on the, uh, uh, on the left in a reel. And the first thing I'm gonna do, and you should always do this, the first thing I'm going to do is what they say, tinning the tip. I'm just gonna put a little bit of solder onto the tip of the iron, and then you, it's off screen, but I've got a little bit of sort of like brass wool in there that I stick the tip in and I move it around, and that just helps keep everything clean. Nine times out of 10, when you've got a problem with your solder joints, it's because you didn't clean the tip. There's the first two. I'm really only touching the solder and the iron and the solder together on the pin for just a second. And once you get into the swing of things, it really goes pretty fast. Now the solder fumes aren't great. You probably wanna have some sort of fume extractor or at least an open window nearby. I had a friend who spent years of his life soldering and he breathed in the fumes and he said that uh, it never caused him any problems. I wouldn't necessarily take that as advice, but uh, don't worry about it uh, a little bit at a time. Now I'm taking a break here to, to clean the tip off again. You'll notice some black buildup that starts to get to it and that can make it harder for the solder to flow freely. And you can see right there, I had two pins that were joined by a little bit of solder, but all I had to do was touch the tip to it and it uh, wicked away from it. it. You don't have to fight with it too much. And there we go, that's the first malt built. That's all it took. It doesn't come through on the camera very well, but the, the solder, look, solder points look pretty good. And you may have noticed on that that there was a little bit of sort of shiny stickiness. That's the flux that's left over. That's what helps the uh, solder all melt together. That can be conductive. And so what I end up doing, I didn't get a video of it here. I take a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and a, uh, an old toothbrush and I give the back a scrub and I rinse it off just using regular old water. You just have to let it dry before you, uh, before you plug it in. Well, this doesn't get plugged in, but you wanna let it dry before you plug anything into it. And now I'm just attaching the uh, rest of the, the nuts to the front panel.
This is just a, a hex wrench. It's a little big for the task. You want to be careful doing this because it will scratch the heck out of the panels if you're not careful. But if you're uh, gentle with it, it just slips over the hex nut and lets you apply just a little bit of tension to it. Get it tightened up nicely. And there you go. I mean, that's it. That is a built module ready to go. Now I, you know, talked a little bit through this and I was still, I actually hadn't built a module in some time before doing this and I still have another one to do. So instead of, you know, taking my time, what I'm gonna do is try to speed run this thing and we'll see how fast I can build that second one. And go. Oh, it's right around seven minutes. That's not bad. Even the first time I built mine, it took me more time to find my soldering iron than it did to build the module, and I hadn't soldered in probably 35 years at that point. Really, it's not difficult. You can do this. And that brings us to the giveaway portion of the video. Learning to build your own modular gear is really exciting, and it opens up a whole new horizon for you. And if you've watched this video to this point, and you're excited about the possibilities of getting into DIY, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give away two full kits for this malt module, the same one I just built. All you need to do is leave a comment and say that you want to enter the giveaway, and then in a week or so I'm going to pick a few names out of a hat, and then you'll get one of the kits shipped out to you. You can have either the silver or black panel, whichever strikes your fancy. And that's it. That's the malts video. Remember to leave a comment if you want to enter the giveaway, and if you made it this far, maybe consider subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Thanks.